Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos. Welcome to Three Girls Theater, Les Wright's BTQ, Marjorie Kreitman's Digital Queer Salon. Welcome all. We're going to get started. So I'm going to kick it off. I am Tina D'Elia. I am your program director of Les Wright's BTQ. Again, this is the Digital Queer Salon. We have seven fierce writers for Marjorie Kreitman's writing class presented to you today. Amazing writers. Three Girls, Girls Theater acknowledges that the land we call San Francisco is the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples. We wish to pay our respect by acknowledging the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. It is an honor to be with all of you tonight. Unfortunately, Marjorie Kreitman had an injury. She's doing okay and regrettably will not be joining us tonight at the salon. However, she sends her love and her best wishes and she is healing and we're sending her big love, big healing energy. And she's so excited about what you're gonna hear with this class. Tanya Tilson has muted all of you for the remainder of the performance to avoid any noises of doorbells or dogs or kitties meowing, you know, neighbors interrupting. For those of you who are joining us who would like to use closed caption, please look at the menu bar below and select live transcriptions. From there, you can enable closed captions to show on the screen. We encourage you to give support. So down below, there are um, emojis that you can put up such as cheers or heart. Um, and also you can, you know, if you have a feather bow or you wanna wave jazz hands after everyone reads, you are welcome to. As another way of showing cheers, we also welcome all the positive uh, notes in the chat. Um, and then please stick around after the performance so you can chat with all of the stars, all of the writers. Um, and let's see, um, please stop your video during the performance if you need to get up um, so that it's less distracting, but you are welcome to be on camera if you are watching the performance. And then a, the best way to view is the top right corner of the screen. You can choose gallery view which allows you to see everyone attending the salon. Speaker's view will keep the person speaking currently at the center of your screen. And we recommend you use speaker view so you can focus on the performer. If you are already on speaker view, great. If you have any questions or any other technical issues, please use the chat to reach out to Tanya who can give you help. So without further ado, I give you Marjorie Kreitman's writing Queer Digital Salon class, and on with the show. I used to believe I was not athletic, but now I'm super physically active. I used to think I was not the outdoor type, but now I'm in nature every chance I get. I used to think all men, all men just want sex, but now I know I can get the touch I want on my own terms. I used to be obsessed with cleanliness, but now I, I use beauty and order as a self-soothing tool. I used to feel I had to save every single penny I earned, but now I relax knowing I'm okay. I used to spend hours making sure I looked good, but now I run my fingers through my hair and dash out the door. I used to travel all over the world, but now I just go to Hawaii every chance I get. I used to feel like an orphan, but now I live with a chosen family. I used to not care about dogs or children, but now they are a huge part of my life. Um, I used to sleep until nine, but now I get up at six. I used to be a clothes box underwater, but now I'm a violin. I used to run until injury, but now I slow down. I used to let my emotions fester like old bath water, but now I welcome them. I used to be paralyzed, but now I'm in motion. I used to drink until I was honest, but now I don't have a reason to lie. I used to be cynical, but now I'm a romantic. I used to be young and wild, but now I'm older and wiser. 
I used to be skinny, but now I'm plump with lots more love handles. I used to be angry, but now I'm filled with love. I used to be rebellious and did whatever I wanted, but now I'm responsible. I used to be fearless, but now I have an anxiety disorder. I used to be drug addicted. But now I've been clean for 43 years. I used to be blinded by people's lies, but now I see them clearly. I used to be part of a big family, but now a lot are gone. I used to be an athlete that was able to play anything, but now I can barely walk two blocks. I used to be surrounded by darkness. But now my heart and spirit are filled with light and love. I used to be anomically alienated from my body and self, and now I'm home in my skin and rooted in me. I used to keep their truths truth secret and unknown, and now I know they're mine to keep. I used to shrink in the face of critical words and thoughts, and now I hit the mute button and thrive because I know sanity is but a myth. I used to be the key that was cut to open each, each lover's lock, and now I am the locksmith. I used to paint because images are really unreadable words, and now my words paint pictures everyone and no one can see. I used to be a Medusa kind of still, congealed by the cold blood of others, but now I've thawed from that ice age and live in the sun. I used to starve my body and heart, wishing I could shrink away, and now I eat potato chips to fatten my spirit. I used to be snow that drifted along sidewalks in a storm, and now I am a snow girl surrounded by flakes. I used to settle for scraps like an unloved stray, and now I am my own favorite pet. I used to be sharper, but now I'm more patient. I used to be smarter, but now I'm more present. I used to be fun, but now I feel everything. I used to be numb, but now I feel everything. I used to distract myself with work. But now I can barely accomplish anything. I used to be better at keeping things inside, but now my bullshit tolerance has worn just a bit too thin. I used to be someone with dreams so big they could touch the sky, but now life has forced me to revise. I used to be less gracious, but now I've gotten pretty good at letting things slide. I used to be afraid of crying, but now I'm very familiar with my river of tears. I used to seek approval externally, but now I'm really only interested in pleasing myself. I used to dictate my stories to my parents. Now I dictate my stories to my phone. I used to sing, but now I creak. I used to feel sexy when it rained, but now it's a headache. I used to have FOMO, fear of missing out, but now I have ROMO, relief of missing out. I used to be a marriage resistor, but now I'm unlawfully married. I used to say I'd never trip again, not wanting to technicolor my disabilities. Now, I wonder. I used to be a moon child, but now I'm past the signs. I used to say I'm neurologically quirky. Now I say I'm neuroqueer. I used to count my allergies on one hand, but now I need many, many hands. I used to be small, but now I'm bigger. I used to be in a body that didn't feel good, but now I'm more at ease. I used to be in a body, but now I am a body. I used to be surrounded by community, but now I'm a different person with a different community. I used to be hugged and touched often, but now I'm not. I used to be buried, but now I'm breathing easier. I used to be on the East Coast, but now I'm back in the Bay. I used to be mostly focused on animals, but now I'm friends with plants as well. I used to be into mountain biking, but now I'm more of a hiker. I used to be a dog person, but now I'm a dog and cat person. 
but really I'm still a dog person. My name is Christina Yates. A letter to my 14 year old self. Sweetheart, hang in there. You are not alone. I am with you. You are working too hard. It's not fair. Fuck that bitch of a woman, your mother. Run away from home. Stop trying to kill yourself. Tell someone, anyone, you are not alone. No, you are not. It just feels that way. Every year you've gone down that rabbit hole, the deep, deep depression. It's not your fault. Run away anywhere. Sweetheart, my heart breaks seeing you worry so about your appearance. Go be physical. Do something really hard with your body. Fuck makeup, shaving your legs, pantyhose. Go use your body. Take a walk. Take a long walk. Go down to the river. Move, move, move. Don't hurt yourself. I know you feel like you're in prison, but it, it's not your fault. You are the best daughter in the world. Fuck school. Don't bother making good grades. Skip homework. Have fun instead. Have fun. Whatever it takes. Tell someone. Do not try to kill yourself. You lived through all those suicide attempts. And I know that was worse than dying. So just don't even bother. Oh, darling, you try so hard. I wish someone had told you about boundaries. I wish your father hadn't left, that your mother could have gotten help, that you weren't so very alone. But in spite of it all, you are amazing, amazing. I know you feel like <clears throat> shit, but you are really, really good. Be a child. It wasn't safe to be little. You had to always look out for your mother by being so very, very, very good. Fuck it all. You are already perfect. The best daughter in the world. You can get touched without letting those boys touch you the way they want. It's your body, not theirs. You are wonderful just as you are. And to hell with the mascara, the lipstick, the looking good, the legs crossed, the house spotlet to please your mother's expectation. Fuck it all. Make a mess. Do it wrong. Don't take a razor to your wrist. Put that gun away. To hell with all those pills. It will get better. I promise. I'm here for you. And I will never leave you. Never, ever. I promise. I am so, so, so very sorry you had to go through that. You are strong as an ox. You are beautiful, sensitive, and lovable, just as you are. And I know, so trust my words, I know you are completely good. You always have been and always will be. And don't you ever, ever forget it. Significant events of 2022, and actually this is from May 1st till now. Left Hawaii for Oakland May 1st, paid thousands of dollars to tenants to move out of my home so I could sell it, got rid of all furniture by giving it away and putting it on the street, put everything I own in a 10 by 10 storage unit, moved from Oakland, California to Eugene, Oregon, Sold my home of 20 years in Oakland. Stayed with many different friends and in more than 10 different homes since May. For weeks and maybe months, averaged four hours of sleep per night. Paddled twice down the Willamette River, camped at Scott Lake for three nights, paddled and hiked and swam a bit. Camped two nights near Coos Bay. Attended many socials with my River Song co-housing sisters moved into River Song co-housing, home at last. Craving. When I started sleeping only four hours at a time, I mostly cut out caffeine, sugar, alcohol, and wheat. Well, actually it was once I was able to stay in the same place for a couple of weeks rather than just constantly moving. 
Then I was able to stop the beer at night, the popcorn right before bed and the coffee in the morning to get going. I'm trying to eat really healthy, like eggs, veggies, no desserts. I gained about 10 pounds after I got the letter from the tenants rights lawyer saying I couldn't stay in my Oakland home, even though all my mail came there, my clothes were in the closet and my vehicle was in the garage. I was so freaked out that I just ate and ate and ate whatever I wanted to. And I stuffed my rage at these young people renting rooms in my home. I had returned from Hawaii physically fit and strong. Returned to Oakland, the big city, and so much fucking stress. I did manage to bike this summer, but I really longed to swim. It feels good to be cleaning up my diet again, and I will get strong. I numbed myself. I numbed myself in that mental hospital in order to get out. I got right down to business and figured out what they wanted and did it as quick as I could in order to get free. And here I am 35 years later, so I guess it worked. Oh, and damn if I don't numb myself all the time. Otherwise, I'd be like a little child laughing and crying all the time. And I sort of wish that was true. But I numb myself daily by not breathing, by obsessing on cleanliness, by eating popcorn, by trying to be efficient, i.e. trying to be a good girl like I tried so hard to be from age five to 17 while I was living alone with mother. And alone with mother is so true because it was very lonely for both of us. Anyway, back to the mental hospital and all the work it took to go forth, return to college, get a fellowship, master's in psychology, and 3,000 fucking hours to become a marriage and family therapist, become an activist in grad school, take on the identity and label psychiatric survivor, get through school without reading one goddamn book because I can't concentrate. ADHD is what the label would be or learning disabilities, I don't know. Was it from the electroshock that they gave me? I don't think so, but I'll never know. I think it's more generational trauma or, you know, maybe just flat out who I am. The artistic intuitive type. Thank you. Okay, I'm Hannah Meyer, and this is the stranger I am most grateful to. The first time I saw her name, I smoothed it across a welcome folder. J.D. Brown. I remember her head bowed, a defiant limp hand raised at a retreat after the social media manager asked if anyone would prefer no pictures of them to be taken. It was the classic story of, she was a resident playwright. I was the unpaid intern. Three years ago, we exchanged three sentences, which were, would you like to go to Whole Foods with us? Do you know if that other intern has printed out my script yet? And do you know what time it is? Now, years later, after a month in Brooklyn, I've resolved to go back to the West, and two days before I leave, I slide into her DMs on Instagram and ask if she'd like to get coffee on Saturday. She's only back for the night, and I say I'm leaving the following day, but we agree to meet by her Amtrak. The next morning, I decide to pierce my ear with a sewing needle, and that afternoon I am lost in Satan's asshole otherwise known as Penn Station in the heat and humidity of July. My phone buzzes as I leap over the turnstiles. I am wearing tan slacks and a sun hat by the sea train, she texts me. After 45 minutes, I locate her leaning against the train station wall, wearing sensible slacks, a sensible pack, and a sensible black floppy hat, like a dignified but wilting badge. She waves me over with a single hand and covers her ears as the train screeches into the station. You've heard about my battle with long COVID, she asks, examining the train seat before sitting down. She explains how trains began to trigger a ringing sound in her ears after her second visit to the ICU. It was the first time that I really felt confronted with my mortality. 
She places a vain hand on the rail. Eyes bright, she recalls the macabre of the pandemic in Brooklyn and the respite of her many residencies in Germany. My paisley pant legs start to blur, and I do not know what to say. I had an intense shrooms trip recently. I really felt the edges of my mortality when I started seeing black shapes. I squint. I pretend to be lost in thought. And remember that this story ended up with me breaking up a friendship to explore color and light outside. I tilt my chin to the heavens of the rattling train car. I try to mimic the expression of contemplation that she had when describing seeing bodies being dragged into trucks and carted to the morgue at the start of the pandemic. There is a truly horrible pause. And then she laughs. I want to hear more of the sound, so I regale her with my tales of couch surfing as I follow her onto the brown stones brimming the sunny sidewalk of Crown Heights. She tells me stories about the being the only queer women about being the only women in writers' rooms in Los Angeles in the early 2000s. She's writing strictly nonfiction now, which changed due to her brain injury from COVID and her summer of state, where she had, quote, such immense artistic crushes and all the brilliant folks at Yaddo, which is like the McDowell colony, but with a far superior pasta selection. I feel a surge of envy so strong that I cannot fathom beginning my, I'm expanding my career in public relations and also working on a novel routine that I've been performing for a month long run at coffee shop chats across the city. I am a sad robot who cannot feel emotions, but can only analyze them. I say, I stare at the tiny scar shaped birthmark on her throat and feel like I'm going to cry or perhaps pass out. Oh, a sliver of emotion weaves itself into her voice. Are you me? She presses her shoulder into mine. Her eyes are bright and cat-like. I choke on my spit, robbed of all retorts wittier than maybe. She steers me around the corner. I'm moving to New York next month, I blurt out in her apartment. It's the fib but I like how the words sound when they hit the air. Her single cerulean eye meets mine in her mirror. I try not to drop a glass of water. Planes fly over the orange sky reflected in her glass dining room table with nothing but a jade coaster and three scripts with pencil note in the center. I peer over her balcony, watching the cars weave in and out of the Brooklyn traffic seven floors below. She powders her forehead in the bathroom, watching me from her reflection. Are you, do you have a girlfriend or are you moving alone? I don't have a girlfriend. I'm moving solo with roommates. Is she asking if I'm available? Does she have a girlfriend? She mentions that her current roommate is moving out. I experience a series of optimistically embarrassing thoughts. Me slouching at her dining room table, sipping espresso at 6 a.m. Would we write together? Would we enter into a relationship similar to Aristotle and his students, but without the pedophilic undertones? She looks away to rub lipstick over her bottom lip. I must say something interesting. I look at her and say, I was actually seeing this couple, though, but it was complicated. I trail off mysteriously and look out the window. She rummages around in her closet and says, I was dating two poly folks, but I realized that the woman was doing it for her boyfriend. And it made me realize that I need something substantial. She re-enters. Khakis. A tiny tie. Blonde hair spilling over white linen shoulders. I have never seen such a gorgeous dweeb. Polyamory. Her. Me. Single. Wowie. Is she hitting on me? Her apartment spins. I must say something deep. So I say... The worst part about polyamory, about life really, is the prospect of being discarded. My mouth makes sounds of agreement on the way to the train station while she tells me about her brilliant Tony Award winning musician colleague who is performing at the bitter end this evening. I have another embarrassing thought. Will she invite me to the concert with her friends? Instead, she asked me if I need help finding my way back to where I'm staying. But before she gets off the train, her hand rests on my leg. 
It ventures closer to my upper thigh. She tips her ear and she tips her lips to my ear and grovels in a grand British accent. When you're back, we'll go to the theater. The train doors close behind the flash of blonde hair, disappearing as quickly as powdered sugar into the air. I look at my reflection in the train window, and I imagine how strangers around us might see us. A playfully bemused woman enticing, or tolerating, the sweaty youth with dried blood dripping down her ear. Is she into me? Or did I imagine her touching my thigh just now? The train doors close. I miss my stop completely. Hi, I'm Sue Oscar. My first piece is something nice a stranger did for me. This past Saturday, I had a group of 10 total strangers that did the nicest thing for me, but I must go back in time to about 10 years ago. I was younger, I was much younger and I had a beautiful garden. I also had many house plants, some that are rescued like poinsettias. One was actually a tree that had two different growths in the pot. I trained them to intertwine together so that they were twisted together. In my garden, I had so many beautiful flowers and plants. My favorite thing in my garden was moonflowers. Moonflowers are in the morning glory family, but these were seeds from plants grown in New Jersey and they were very special to me. The seeds came from the house that I grew up in as a teenager. The moonflowers only bloom at night and only last one day. They had long white blooms that looked like trumpets horns. I'd sit out at night to watch them open. It was an amazing thing to watch them open. It was like watching a flower bloom and fast forward, but it was in real time. They were beautiful. Present day, a few months ago, somebody from the VA who I showed pictures of my garden to ask me if I'd like to be a project of heroic gardens. I was thrilled that I'd have the chance to get my garden back for I love the garden. I would brag to people that I don't just have green thumbs, but I have green hands. Well, they contacted me and came out to clear out my garden bed, which had been overgrown with a vine for 10 years. It was a pest. There were six or seven total strangers came out to clean my garden so that they could come back and replant a month later. There were 10 total strangers that came back and made the outside of my house beautiful once again. They made my heart happy, not just because they gave me something beautiful to see, uh, but the overabundance of hugs and love they showed to me, a total stranger. It made me believe that there are still good, kind-hearted people left in this world. My second piece, as I reach my last days, I'm not planning on going anywhere anytime soon. We don't know when that time will be. I have some things that I want to express. First, I want to express my gratitude for each and every one that has come into my life since I was born. Each of you have been loved by me. You all came into my life for a reason. You all have touched my heart and my life in one way or another. Some more than others, but all loved. I felt various emotions in my life, from total heartbreak to total joy. Fear not, I'll never leave you. I'll be there forever in spirit for my soul will not die, as each one of yours won't. I hope I've touched every one of you, just as you have touched my heart and soul. You've never been forgotten and never will. I never found that love I sought because I was looking in the wrong place. I had to look, seek, and find it within myself. I finally found it, Lisa. Just as I had answered you when you asked me what I wanted most of my life when you were 15 and I was 20. Such a huge question coming from someone of your age and just a few days before we all lost you. That was the total heartbreak of a lifetime. One that I hope no one ever else has to experience. I thank you for asking that question. 
I found, finally found the answer some 44 years later. It had to come from within. I'm very happy with who I am. The universe has seen to it that it happened. And all I had to do was ask, just as anyone else just has to ask, seek and ye shall find. Thank you, for my dear sister, for all those, and for all those who helped me reach my destination. I am forever grateful. My life is complete. I love you all. My last piece, <coughs> excuse me. Describe my pet's day from their perspective. Hi, my name is Titi. My day starts between 11, uh, 10 or 11 p.m. when my human mom goes to bed. I work the night shift. When she's sitting to bed, she stops and scratches my chin, says goodnight, and she turns out the light and go to bed. Now, it's my time to lay in the kitchen, and stare at the dishwasher and the lower cabinets. I'm hunting for them damn mice. I will lay here for hours waiting and waiting. I listen, I watch, and I wait, and I watch. And I repeat until 4 a.m. I hear something move. Oh, it's a mouse. Like that stuff, like the stuff ones that rattle when my mom throws them for me to chase. I love chasing things. I also love to throw the mice around. It moves and I lurch, jumping on it, picking it up in my mouth, then tossing it in the air. Oh, how mom will be pleased if I bring it to her while she's sleeping. What a great surprise I'll bring her. She's going to love it. Well, I dropped it on the bedroom floor, but the sucker escaped. Now I have to find and catch it again so I can show mom what I caught. She's going to love it. I caught it again. And again, I pick it up in my mouth and toss it in the air. It falls to the floor. I take my paw and swipe at it. It gets away again. This time mom wakes up. She turns the light on and starts screaming and cussing a bit. I don't think she likes my surprise. I grab it in my mouth and take it out to the living room. Meantime, mom comes out, turns every light on the apartment, and again, the damn mouse gets away. This time it runs behind the TV stand. Oh my God, I'll never get behind there to catch my prize. But nevertheless, I try. I'm skinny and can squeeze into many places, but not here. Damn it, I lost it for now. Well, I'll just sit here in front of the TV stand until I fall asleep, hoping the mouse will come back out. God, I'm getting sleepy. I guess it's time for bed for now. Mom will be up in three hours to serve me breakfast. Good night, mouse. I'll catch you another time. P.S. She caught the mouse early Thursday morning. T.T. three, mice zero. Evening. My name is Michelle, and the first piece I will be reading is called Dear 14 Year Old Self. Dear 14 Year Old Self, no one can see how different you feel. And don't worry, you don't stand out in a crowd. You're a gangly weirdo, just like every other teen. And it's true that you'll never totally understand the girl boy cis het thing till you come into your own. Oh, my sweet young self, you will try so hard to get it. Until then, like a silly little boy, you'll pull the older girl's bra straps because you were flirting and didn't know. You'll make the best art you can for the pretty girl summer camp supervisors. And indeed, those hard crushes on girls will crush you hard. The art teachers who wear thick bracelets and chunky shoes will know you because they were you. You'll no longer wonder why looking at their biceps made your nipples harden in summer. Soon it will all make sense. The scream in your chest when the cool teacher talks to another student will go away. And, you walk, and when you walk into your first dike bar in 1990, you won't need your passport to know your home. When you see the Kodiak boots, the posturing of butches wooing femmes, the plaid wearing women holding beer like truck drivers and women holding women as they sway to Melissa Etheridge. The pain screams will silence. And a moist logic of its own will reign. Just wait, because when you figure out what to do in bed, it'll be game on. 
Her moisture and hair will feel like alfalfa growing in soil. You'll touch and realize that pussies speak out when they are caressed. Her skin will rise like tendrils reaching for your fingers. Her nipples will become armor at your touch. And you'll remember the seventh grade boy who said, turn them like radio dials was an absolute idiot as you soon discover. That's when you'll know you're an expert. Do you remember that time at grandma's with her handheld shower head? How it softened the hard ache in your curious mound? Your fingers will move smooth like the feel of cashmere over your polyester bra cap. The pressure you loved? Remember when you sit, you were six, when you packed your panties with tightly bound socks? Is this what a cock feels like, you wondered? Yet you'll never know. And yes, your mother will get over it. You'll die and be reborn into a thousand incarnations of yourself. You'll lie and deceive and fuck men till you finally believe that your pussy won't lie. That wet purr that makes you hum and writhe, the ice cream like smooth silk, and the rising texture of her nipples, the way they call and respond to your tongue song. And I can tell you that you will cry for the first time you lost finding your way home. When you finally come so hard you cry because someone finally read your information. The braille your skin rose for her reading fingers. You'll grieve for all the effort you made sucking cocks till you gagged as your head was pushed to their pleasure. When you get here, when you feel hers and she feels yours, That'll be it, just like magic, clickety-clit. The next piece is inspired by a prompt, the bird chirped. Every mother wants to be a Hall of Famer parent. To become the Hall of Fame mother to her 21-year-old daughter, Sally decided to take her to Nashville to celebrate her I Can Drink Legally in America milestone birthday. It would be a lovely moment in mother-daughter bonding. Sally pined with all her I'm not good enough self-perception this this would be the opportunity of their lifetimes. She anticipated how the trip would shift them from mother-daughter to contemporary peers budding into a growing friendship. This would be fostered sharing and experiencing the marvels of the city they had yet to discover. They'd raise a glass while listening to country music live and together lose themselves in the magic other places create. Sally imagined they would shop and eat and laugh like the gaggle of girls portrayed in Sex in the City. They'd have a few drinks and dance a jig or two, and then her daughter would have a few more. Sally soon realized that dream theory is sometimes better than practice. The travel blogs described the hop on, hop off tourist bus as a fascinating foray into famous Nashville attractions. Once aboard the hop on hop off bus, Sally watched the chipper bridal parties on party buses passing by, enjoying the nation's bachelorette party capital attractions and alcohol. Sally teared at the sight of happy young ladies who rode the party tractors celebrating their hopeful matrimonial love. She watched their writhing dances, dancing bodies drunk with joy and grieved for that happy she never had. She was finally her own bachelorette party, finally free from the discolored dysfunction of her underwhelming, unloving hetero marriage. Sally hopped in and hopped out of that blasphemous time and to, into the life and future of her whole self. The wannabe winning mother observed fellow passengers who were the grinning bell ringers post chemo women smiling about reaching 60, a happy that beamed brighter than the sun reflecting off ice covered ground. Sally was the lone tourist mom who made her way around Nashville alone. The 21 year old daughter received a huge inheritance from the family gene pool and hung out in her hangover while Sally rode the hop on hop off. She chose curiosity as her travel companion and together they enjoyed the wonders of this Southern Mecca. Curiosity didn't have much to say, but certainly had much to see. She gazed through the camera lens and took and took in so much of the town. Nashville's history was very much untold by monuments and the stories the tour guides chose to tell. The invisible and unacknowledged rumors tourists didn't need to hear. The nice bus driver tourist guide pointed out that there were music halls and music row, the country music hall of fame, and oh yeah, of course, on the left is the African-American Music History Museum. 
The bus climbed and descended crane lined streets and gentrifying spaces. Next appeared a sculpture an architect dedicated to the six tribes whose traditional territories became Tennessee. Soon, Sally and her passengers hopped off the bus and into the famous Centennial Park, celebrating a century since the state's founding questionable glory. It features Tennessee, it featured Tennessee's exact replica of the Parthenon, celebrating more than a century of colonial politic. Was it ironic how its Athenian-like grandeur and the history of distilled spirits, both bottled and other, took up space here? Across from Tennessee's Parthenon is the beautiful copper Tennessee Woman's Suffrage Monument. Ironically, it's designed by a man. And the park commemorates Southern juxtapositions. And the happy tourists listen to the chirping blue or gray trickster, trickster bird that Native Americans say can't be trusted. Perhaps Tennessee historians are unknowingly inspired by this native species. Thank you. My name is Anna Wilcoxon and my pronouns are they, them. And this first piece is inspired by the prompt running away from home. I dread winter. I dreaded it growing up near Chicago. I dreaded it in Southern Illinois, New Orleans, Oregon, New York, and now since returning to Chicago, I'm dreading it here again. The winter dread follows me around like a lost little kid, regardless of the varying distinctive features of regional winters. But just now, in the midst of this windstorm we are having here in Chicago, I looked out the window through the little crack behind my blackout curtains, and there was a feeling of cohesion, as if my body has been waiting to come back to this place to fuse together the pieces of me that have spent so many years shattering, scattering, and losing their way. This place draws them back like a beehive, like some sensory internal knowing. This is home. This is where I rose from the ashes, grew from the intermingling DNA of two barely adult humans, their blood and bones nourished from this land and water and air, this exact air that I now breathe once again. Maybe my body needed this to heal. Maybe the universe knew that and made Chicago my only viable option in the midst of my 15 year long housing musical chairs. Look, I'm still dreading the winter, but I also feel quick flutters of gentle anticipation from its imminence as well. Remember those calm nights at home when it was just you and your mom, my body asks me. Remember the quiet and the foot rubs under homemade Afghans and warm vegetable soup in your belly. Remember the glow of the multicolored Christmas lights strung around the plastic tree covered in popcorn, garland, handmade ornaments, and chocolate mint candy canes? Remember the peace? You had that sometimes too. You did. You deserve that feeling. You don't have to keep chasing the pain. Just because there was more of the hard things doesn't mean that's what you deserve you're coming back into yourself and you can start over from here. <laughs> All of this from a fleeting peak at an impending winter sky ushered in with rushing winds, peeling away the remaining layers of autumn's decay like rust colored brush strokes in the sky. It will inevitably let me down just as my anticipation of autumn did. There is no easy solution to this attempt at reloving myself into the phantom existence I feel in another strand of the universe. But coming home is not a return to what was. It is a return to what could have been and a chance to follow that strand of possibility into the phantom universe on your own terms now. You don't need to run anymore. Welcome home. And the second one is a combination of, of prompts, um, craving for something you can't get enough of, no remorse and a long solitude. 
There's this song about a cheesecake truck. It's just one long spoken story told rather frantically over a jaunty little tune about a guy who essentially steals a cheesecake truck, eats a cheesecake, then another and another and another until he eats all the cheesecakes in the truck. And then he ends the story by saying that he doesn't really feel bad for doing this because they were very good cheesecakes. I've always appreciated this song or story or strange little piece of Dadaist art, I suppose, not just because I love the whimsy and freedom inherent in this version of the avant-garde, but because it's also very relatable. If I got my hands on a truck full of cheesecake, I too would consume the entirety of its contents and not feel one bit of remorse. On my 35th birthday, spent alone after nearly a year in complete pandemic-induced isolation, I decided to make myself a cheesecake, the first I'd ever made, every part completely from scratch. And it turned out perfectly. I mean, just immaculate. Like it was made to grace the cover of a magazine. Not a single crack in the foundation, the exact right amount of golden browning on the edges, a pristinely packed and even crust, a perfectly level top, and a wonderfully fluffy, creamy center. My God, what a gift to give to myself. I had intended to share, uh, to take pieces to neighbors and friends, leaving it on their doorstep as was custom in those days. But instead, I ate the whole thing. And in record time, I might add. I think it was around for maybe three days, something like that. I suppose I'd be ashamed if it weren't such good cheesecake. I mean, sharing it would have only really been an excuse to show off. So it was better to consume my own hubris and let it move through me rather than to project it onto everybody else. I would like to say that this cheesecake would go down in history as the best birthday cake I've ever had. But if a cheesecake gets eaten alone in the forested dark night of the soul, did it ever get baked in the first place? Honestly, I don't remember much of the last two, nearly three years. I've come from a long line of type A robotic, like memory neurotics who can tell you almost down to the exact date when some inconsequential event occurred. And I've often prided myself on being one of them. <laughs> no, 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 you're incorrect. It was actually 2013 when you were a glitter cowboy for Mardi Gras. I remember because I went as fat share and it was rainy that year, but warm. And I had just been dumped. And we met up at that bar on Decatur after I got a half pound burger at Quartermaster where that drunk gay guy told me that I looked nothing like share, but I had a great rack. Boom, 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 synapses flat firing left and right. And you know what? I'm pretty much always correct. It's hard to forget something like being broken hearted in a leather jacket and a thong swimsuit while consuming half a pound of beef on the rainy streets of New Orleans. But see, remembering things like that, those synapses firing, all of that requires things, events, life being lived, connections. But when nothing happens, when all the days blur into one long, lonely, endless cycle of sleeping and waking, connections die, memories fade, years pass by without you even noticing. Wasn't it just a year or so ago that Anthony Bourdain died? I asked a friend the other day. <laughs> no, she said. That was like a good few years ago. And I realized my brain is oriented to the last few years as if they just didn't even exist. For the first time in my life, I get confused about when something happened. Loneliness and isolation mean no events, not much worth remembering. <laughs> but I remember that cheesecake. Oh God, how delicate, how it was better than any cheesecake I'd ever purchased and how I savored every single bite. In that cheesecake truck song, the guy says that the only solution he could think of after eating all those cheesecakes was to hide the truck somewhere and disappear. He says he'd miss everyone a lot, but it was worth it because they were very delicious cheesecakes. But I get it. In the depths of my soul, I truly understand the insatiable urge to consume all of the cheesecakes. I mean, I ate an entire cheesecake in three days. That birthday cheesecake.
that special birthday cheesecake, which stands out because it was something of an event in the midst of this amorphous grayness that has become my life. And it was very delicious cheesecake. But regardless of my gluttonous desire to have it all for myself, I would have traded that cheesecake, even a truckload of cheesecake that good for a little more of life worth remembering. I'm Barbara Ruth. The first piece is from The Prompt, a left-handed compliment. 10% of the world's population is naturally left-handed. Right-hand supremacy, though rarely talked about, is omnipresent and insidious. In the Soviet Union, left-handedness was not acknowledged as a natal variation, but rather seen as something bourgeois, decadent, reeking of late stage capitalism and the West, something to eradicate and tell the world, we don't have that here. 10%. Reminds me of some other people the USSR said they didn't have. I first learned the connection between left-handedness and queerness when I was 19, reading Lawrence Durrell. In the Alexandria Quartet, the narrator archly refers to a lesbian character as left-handed. She likes it. Around the world campaigns to eradicate or stigmatize left-handedness persist. Here in the heart of late stage capitalism, not so long ago, left-handed kids had their hands tied to force them to write with their right. This happened to my father, the first lefty in my life. I have loved so many lefties I have purchased left-handed pens, notebooks, scissors, button-down shirts. Much more I've found in left-handed catalogs. I delight in the tantric left hand of wisdom, the left behinds and the left undones, and still so much is left. I have been on the left, sometimes the far left, all my adult life. Is it any wonder I hang with lefties? Look what monsters the right has spawned. When I give my lefty soulmate a special gift, she does not say it's all right, but rather it's just what I wanted. I can't believe you found it. I didn't think there were any left. When she smiles and kisses me in her lesbian way, then I know. I have received a left-handed compliment. The next piece is from the prompt, Running Away From Home. I was 22 and miserably married. I was miserable with him for most of the year before our wedding. I was a bisexual anarchist hippie with no respect for the institution of marriage. No piece of paper had the power to define or confine me. Marriage was important to him, and since I didn't care one way or the other, I said, what the hell? We found an ethical culture leader to perform this ceremony at a museum where my old man worked restoring art. The wedding became a happening, a multimedia event. I chose the music, wrote the vows, perfected the menu and arranged the flowers. Marriage didn't matter to me, but no matter how much we fought, I wasn't about to cancel the performance. We woke with dueling migraines on the day. We arrived at the museum moving slowly, thanks to a few pills from the bottle of Demerol he stole from Smith Klein and French pharmaceuticals when he worked there as a bench chemist. The lights, the toasts, the smell of food were torture. I couldn't wait for the wedding to be over 
so I could lie down in our dark bedroom, ice pack on my head. So many migraines, so much ice. Because of his fists, because of the gun in his underwear drawer, because he was 17 years older, I thought the only way I would truly escape was when he died. In the meantime, Demerol dulled the pains. Sometimes I tried to make things better. Sometimes I sank into the misery. We had our pleasures. I loved planning our honeymoon in Europe. I wanted to make love in every country. He wanted to steal something in every country. Being an accomplished thief, he got his wish, even in Iceland, where we never left the airport. 1971, Christmas Day. We began to hassle fast and hard. He slapped me, and I knew I needed to escape. I grabbed a backpack, nothing more than my ID and a couple of bucks, and was out the door, down four flights, and gone. He didn't follow. The first place I found open was a gas station. The attendant's eyes snarled at me. His laugh said he knew everything that brought me there. I had to leave immediately. I found a bench where no one waited for the buses that didn't run on Christmas and sat, shivered, and cried. I thought back to all the things I could have done when we met in 1968. I'd been kicked out of college, broke up with my girlfriend, and was searching for the next chapter of my life. I was at that crossroads where adventures called my name, luring me in different directions. One beckoned toward India. I'd been invited by my yoga teacher to live on his ashram. One said, come to Chicago to work with Jane, the underground abortion providers. I'd met a woman at a poetry reading who was part of the Jane Collective. I could find her. I could call my friends in Students for a Democratic Society and through them join Weather Underground. I could have reconciled with my girlfriend and the hardcore druggy dykes she crashed with now since she replaced psychedelics with speed and heroin. While the rituals of rigs and fire tempted me, ultimately, they scared me straight. That's when I met this old man who collected pretty things. I moved in with him a week after we met. Now, teeth chattering on a bench on Christmas day, I could think of no one I could call. I went back to the apartment, slid under the covers. Neither of us acknowledged my departure or return. I couldn't figure out how to get away. Trying to pack overwhelmed me. How would I carry my stuff down the steps? Where would I go? My parents would have taken me back, but that meant admitting they were right about the consequences of my hippie ways. When I tried to leave, he'd threaten me, threatened to kill the cats. When I called the cops, he was always so calm, and I never was. The cops said if he killed the cats, I could take him to small claims court, prove what they were worth, and sue him for half. Seven, that's the average number of tries it takes before a battered woman gets away, according to domestic violence statistics. The time she is at greatest risk is when she leaves and immediately after. The presence of a gun in the house increases the chance of homicide by 500%. It took me six years to escape. I succeeded because of Lori, a lesbian willing to take a chance on a married woman, willing to love and shelter me in her peaceful home, knowing that put both of us in danger. It took Lori and her, 
our community to give me the courage and resources to go, not as far as India, not as far as any of the undergrounds I knew about, but out of his house and out of that marriage for good. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Emlyn. I use he, him pronouns. Um, my first piece is based off of a few, a lot of different prompts, but mainly she begs for more and faking it. Pause. Moment. Last month, I performed a burlesque routine for the first time since college. I had so missed burlesque, but even more so, I'd missed burlesque people and spaces. My college burlesque troupe was one of the most radical and ferociously talented groups of people I've ever been a part of, in part because of the way the group explicitly held space for everybody at every stage of self-exploration and acceptance. We talked about fantasy and desire. We explored sex and sexuality and gender and bodies and disordered eating and allosexuality and asexuality and body neutrality and movement and heat and lust and consent. It felt okay there in that space to be exactly who I was, to struggle with my name and my body, to show up, to somehow find something like stability by living in the questioning of it all. And boy, do I have questions. <laughs> Second puberty will do that to a person. I feel like I'm becoming more allosexual and aromantic potentially, it's so hard to tell. Going through puberty again is fucking exhausting sometimes. My body is changing in so many ways still, even if it looks and sounds more subtle than it did a year ago. My facial hair is figuring out what the fuck is going on. My stomach and muscles and whole body is trying to nourish itself with a way higher metabolism and a stomach that's still the same size and a brain body stomach that is trying to figure out how to feel full, how to want to be full, how to want to eat, a body that is figuring out how to be touched and to want touch and to ask for and receive touch from a world that fetishizes and demonizes this body. I've never had sex that has felt like good, like all the way good. Maybe with my first girlfriend in high school, where we were learning about being queer and about our bodies together, I never really started thinking about my body sexually or like looking at it until then. Maybe it's an ace thing or a trans thing or trauma thing. Surely some combination of all of the above. Also a queer thing. But also that's probably not true because what am I defining sex as? I think that just then I was thinking of it in a pretty limited view, but if I'm thinking of sex as just like another person causing arousal in another person or mutual arousal, desire, where does sex begin and end? What happens if an ace and aloe person are having sex? I worry a lot about sex, about how I'm perceived and thinking and talking about it. I think there was a lot more joy in some ways when I was nav navigating sex as a lesbian. Then again, that was a joy with false foundations. This is hard to write about. <laughs> These are troubled waters and I'm scared of drowning. Breathe. I wish I wasn't always someone's first when it comes to sex and like deconstructing toxic masculinity again with, fetish, with fetishization and demonization. And at the same time, I really fucking get it. I understand, but it just fucks me up that I've done all of this work and moving through trauma from men and women and non-binary people just to exist and want to exist and then have folks of all genders see me as a thing through which to process their own trauma. The next piece I'll be reading is in response to a letter to my 14 year old self. Hi. 
hi, me. This is you from the future. I'm 25. It's November. I'm not calling you by your name because, um, well, I don't think you know about trans people yet, really. But we have a different name now. My name is Emlyn. Is that weird to hear? My God, this is weird for me. Emlyn is a man's name. It's Welsh and means either waterfall or around the valley, depending on where you look on the internet. It's also the name of a playwright who isn't really important, but theater is. You work in theater? You're writing this for a class, actually, because you're trying to tell this story. I've been going through pictures of us from when we were little lately, trying to find the boy and person I was and am under all the clouding layers of other people's perceptions. But looking at pictures of you, you at 14, that still makes me feel not nauseous, but I guess it makes me dissociate a little. It's extremely painful. <laughs> you were going through a puberty that was making you want to die makes me want to die thinking about it. I'm so sad and angry for you. You also didn't have very good friends. Although you made your first connection unbeknownst to either of you with another trans person, other friendships started falling away, making space for new ones. You met your siblings, Adele and Audrey. You walked to school with Becca. You met another trans man, again, without knowing it. I hope he's okay. You met two, actually. I hope he's okay, too. I think he'll be more okay, though. You met Carrie and had a life-changing class, read some incredible books. Kay went to college and you moved into her room and started to try to be your own person through attaching yourself to the scaffolding of others' lives, trying to create a blueprint for your own. And you came out to Adele on a street corner. You came out to yourself, too, somewhere along the way. These are the things that have stayed with you. The popsicle sticks, the falling leaves and rushing wind, morning walks to school cloaked in fog, those walks echoing with your serial burps, sorry, not sorry at all, dancing like it would save your life to take on me by aha, skinny dipping in winter, dog love, tamales for New Year's and Aj wearing goggles with milk in them, crushing on your ninth grade science teacher, writing your way out in Carrie's class, tides of suicidal ideation, self-harm, dressing as life and handing out lemons for Halloween, a corn maze, queer desire, letting go of soccer and softball, injuring your ankle, struggling with social interactions, Stephen leaving and everything changing, you changing, you desolate, and determined and deeply joyful. My love, things are better now. They are still hard and they are better. It is like this all the time and it's still worth it. I'll come back soon. Love, Emlyn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, writers. Congratulations. Thank you, amazing audience. Such a supportive, incredible audience. Another round of applause for Chris, Hannah, Anna, Barbara, Sue, Emlyn, and Michelle. Thank you, 3GT's Tanya Tielsen, our magical tech director, Zoe Jen, incredible fierce program coordinator and co-facilitator of the class. Thank you, creative designer artist, Carissa Doherty for making the beautiful postcard. And we are all thinking of you, Marjorie Kreitman, healing. Thank you, our fearless lesbian leader and class teacher. Uh, with your divine brilliance, how you put all these prompts together. And we're all just sending you our biggest 
biggest healing thoughts. If any of you out there are interested in learning about how to take a future class with Marjorie Kreitman, you can both go to our website, threegirlstheater.org. You can always email either myself, Tina, threegirlstheater.org or Zoe at threegirlstheater.org. We'd love to hear from you. If you all enjoyed the performance out there, please consider making a donation to Three Girls Theater so we can continue developing and presenting LBTQ non-binary writers. You can find a link to donate at threegirlstheater.org. Tanya's, Tanya's also included. Tanya, I think we'll put a link in the chat if I'm not mistaken, yes. Um, lastly, next year, announcements of events we're having. We, for those of you who are in the Bay Area, um, the New Works Festival that, um, that will also be recorded and eventually on our YouTube channel uh, will be at Z Below in San Francisco. Very exciting. So there'll be new works. There'll be works from folks that we've been uh, working with in our development programs. That New Works Festival of Three Girls Theater will be between March 1st and 19th. And then in the spring, There'll be three, uh, excuse me, four playwrights with Les, Les Rights BTQ being presented at the Phoenix Theater in San Francisco between uh, May 30th, June 6th, June 13th, and June 20th for Pride. And all shows are free and proof of vax and masks must be worn at the readings. So just stick around to chat 